I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Professor Martin Rees, British cosmologist, astrophysicist, and the 15th Astronomer Royal, a post first established in 1675, to which he was appointed in 1995. Professor Rees has a BA, MA, and PhD from Cambridge, supervised by Dr. Dennis Yama. And after his postdoctoral studies in the UK and abroad, later worked as a professor at Sussex University, the University of Cambridge, and Gresham College. He's also been the director of the Institute of Astronomy and later the Master of Trinity College at Cambridge. Professor Rees has authored over 500 research papers and numerous books and has made contributions to the origin of cosmic microwave background radiation, black hole formation, quasars, gamma ray bursts, as well as more expansive topics in anthropic reasoning and the multiverse. He's also been supporter of the SETI project and has chaired the advisory board for the Breakthrough Listen project. An honor and a privilege to have you with me today, sir. It's a great pleasure to be with you. So in the 2018 Breakthrough Conference, you speculated on humanity's future in the next century and asked whether aliens watching us from afar would see a final spasm of human war, ecological disruption, and climate change followed by silence, or would they instead see our ecology stabilize and witness an armada of rockets launched from Earth spawning new oases of life elsewhere in the universe? Now, in your words, the answer likely depends on three advancing technologies, biotech, AI, and space. So I'm wondering what made those technologies the important choice for you? Well, they are all technologies which can be... Uh life-changing for the whole world and the main point of that uh, quote is that the acceleration of technological change is continuing and it's got to the stage when our technology can affect and even destroy the whole species um, we are empowered by technology for good and for ill and this really happens in two ways one is our collective effect on the environment because there are more of us than ever before, over 8 billion now, and we're all using more in the way of energy and resources. So we are uh, causing changes like uh, global warming, etc. That's one thing. But the second is that powerful technologies um, like uh, biotech, which could allow us to generate viruses more dangerous than natural ones, um, and cybertech, which already allows us to um, uh, have cyber attacks on infrastructure. All those things could, if misused, lead to a breakdown of our civilization. And of course, they both have great positive effects, as of course does space technology, but they do have downsides. And so the stakes are getting ever higher and there are ever greater problems with governance, given that even a small number of people have the power given to them by these technologies to completely change and even destroy civilization on the world. Well, if I understand correctly, the development of those technologies, again, biotech, AI, and space technologies, provide us with the tools to save our own biosphere here on Earth. And that is something that you talked about extensively yes. in the Breakthrough Conference. They also provide us with the means to begin adapting our own bodies to life in space and other planets. But in that same talk, you said, don't ever expect to see mass emigration from Earth. And you mentioned that you strongly disagree with Elon Musk's goal for the rapid colonization of Mars. Why is that? Yes. Well, uh, let me just uh, nuance that a bit. Um, I think uh, uh, Elon Musk has said that he would like to die on Mars, but not on impact. And... Uh, uh, if he can do that 40 years from now and take a few uh, fellow adventurers with him, then great, we'll cheer them on. Um, but what I wanted to say is something elaborated in a fairly recent book, which I wrote with uh, uh, my friend Don Goldsmith. Um, uh, we don't think it's realistic to have mass emigration, and we don't think it's realistic to have uh, a NASA program in the near future, aimed at sending people to Mars. And I'll tell you the reason for that. The reason is that if NASA does something, they've got to be rather risk averse. To give an example, 
uh, the shuttle was launched 135 times, I think, and it failed twice. And those two failures uh, caused the death of the seven people in the crew, including civilians and, and females. And those were traumatic events. And NASA tried to cut the risk down to even less than 2% without much success. But if we consider a trip to Mars, a six-month journey, risks of radiation and all kinds of problems, and getting people back as well, then that is never going to be as safe as 98% success. It's going to be very risky. And therefore, if NASA starts to do it, one suspects there'd be sort of a holding back, raising the cost and delays, etc. On the other hand, we know very well that there are people who are prepared to go to Mars with a 50% chance of coming back, or even on a one-way trip. Um, and so if uh, people get to Mars by the end of a century, I think it's unrealistic to believe that there would be lots of people funded by NASA, but quite realistic to believe that there'd be a few people funded by billionaires or sponsors on a cut price venture, which accepts that there are very high risks. So wow. I think a few people will go, and by the end of a century, um, those people will be there. They'd be living in great discomfort um, because um, the hostile climate and uh, there, the different gravity, the lack of atmosphere, etc., means they have to be in a cave or under some sort of dome. And uh, that being so, um, it's only going to be a minority. And um, it's true that if we look very far ahead, um, there are ideas of terraforming Mars uh, so as to give it a an atmosphere like the Earth, etc., and then it could be a place where many people could go to. But in the foreseeable future, um, it's unlikely that people want to go and live in a place far less clement than the bottom of the ocean, the South Pole, or the top of Everest. Uh, so it's a dangerous delusion, in particular, to think that we can solve the Earth's problems by escaping to Mars from them. Um, dealing with climate change is very hard, as we know, but it's simple. It's a doddle compared to terraforming Mars to make Mars habitable. And so it's a dangerous distraction from doing what we have to do to ensure that uh, uh, we don't uh, destroy our planet's climate um, and uh, um, destroy the diversity of life on Earth. That was a rather long answer, but that's really a nuanced picture. That I hope there will be some people on Mars, um, but uh, not in the way that uh, some people envisage. It was wonderful, and I'm so pleased that you mentioned the book that you co-authored with Donald Goldsmith. That was The End of Astronauts. I'm going to drop a link into the show notes for that so that people can read that, learn more Thank about you. it. You went in depth into all of these ideas in that book and discussed the frail nature of organic life and speculated that even if humanity can modify DNA to support life in space, machines are far more suited to the task of space exploration. And you have also suggested that it will either be machine-based post-biological humans or artificial intelligence systems that humans create that will ultimately explore space on our behalf. Right. Well, I think so, because already we know what marvelous things uh, robots can do, um, uh, driving over the surface of Mars, etc., um, and uh, having enough AI to evade rocks and obstacles. They don't yet have enough AI to decide what's a geologically interesting place to dig, but they'll have that in 10 or 20 years. And it's far, far cheaper to send a robot. It doesn't need feeding on the way. You don't need to bring it back. Um, and uh, uh, and so we can send hundreds or thousands of robots for the cost of sending sending people. And a similar argument applies to actually um, assembling big structures in space. Um, uh, it's very good that uh, uh, Musk is bringing us uh, rockets which can launch more than 100 tonnes of stuff into low Earth orbits. And that opens up the possibility in a serious way of technology being done in space. Um, but there again, um, that can be done using robots to assemble the structures. Um, so um, there's very exciting developments, but um, all the practical things can be done by robots, not with the present AI, but with the kind of AI that will be available plausibly by uh, 2050, which is the mm. earliest because we imagine pe people going to Mars. And so, as I say, the uh, 
purpose of sending people is no more than as an adventure. And I'm not disparaging that. That's great. We would cheer these people on. Um, but uh, they won't be going to do anything very practical. In terms of machines, this is a wonderful, big, mind-blowing idea. And, you know, I think for a lot of people, they would look at this and have difficulty accepting it. But right now, we have robotic probes exploring nearly every planet in the solar system. In the last decade, we've made landings on comets and asteroids as well. And in terms of where technology is going, there's a discussion underway right now about whether today's AI systems constitute a rudimentary form of artificial general intelligence. And NASA has just announced, I think in the last month or so, that they believe they have found 12 new exoplanets that may contain oceans. So would it be fair to say that what we're talking about today, this is not a scenario for the distant future? You'd mentioned 2050. I mean, this is stuff that is happening today, right? This this is near term. Yes. Um, well, the um, uh, exploration of all the bodies of our solar system um, the planets and their moons, um, that is near term, that's been done. There are um, two uh, probes, one European, one American, on their way to Jupiter to look at Europa, the moon that's ice-covered and may have liquid water underneath it, uh, etc. And that's one thing. Um, and the second thing that's happening is that we are getting more information on uh, planets orbiting other stars, of course, until 25 years ago. Uh, we didn't know definitely that these existed, whereas now it's fairly clear that most stars are orbited by retinues of planets, just as the sun is orbited by the Earth and the other familiar planets. And so reasonable estimates suggest that there are probably at least a billion planets rather like the young Earth orbiting stars in our Milky Way galaxy. And the chances of getting some information, at least a crude spectrum of the nearer ones, within the next uh, 20 years is quite high. The James Webb Telescope um, may be able to do this um, for some of them. And uh, another important instrument is going to be the um, European uh, Giant Telescope, unimaginably called the Extremely Large Telescope, the ELT, which is being built at the moment in Chile and it's got a 39 meter diameter mirror. Amazingly, it's not one sheet of glass, it's a mosaic of 800 sheets of glass, but that can collect a lot more light than the James Webb telescope and uh, get spectra. It can't go into the infrared, which is a big advantage that the James Webb will have. But anyway, uh, those two instruments are quite likely to be able to find evidence of life if it is there. I'm not thinking of intelligent life. I'm thinking of um, uh, of plants or trees or something like that, uh, which will affect the atmosphere and maybe the surface spectrum. So that's something that will happen. But um, to, to link these two things together, um, uh, ro robots um, can uh, go to the outer parts of our solar system. Indeed, it's not, not much more difficult for a robot to go all the way to Jupiter sleeps all the way, uh, just as it can go to Mars. Um, but of course, um, sending anything to one of the other stars is a different matter. And the mm. idea of humans going to other stars, of course, is in the far, far future and probably impossible unless one has a huge extensive lifespan. Um, so it will be um, uh, robots um, or post-humans, which have become more like robots and maybe electronic and which are near in in, nearer immortal, uh, will, which will be able to traverse the interstellar distances to other stars. Well, this brings up the question of if our own future in space is post-biological, and if we mm -hmm. already have robots exploring the better part of the solar system, it's machines that are doing the work and will be doing it in the foreseeable future. Shouldn't the search for extraterrestrial intelligence be also including more of a search for machine-based civilizations as well? And if it did, how would that be different than the way that they are currently searching for life um, elsewhere? Um, well, um, I certainly agree that the search should be 
um, for uh, um, electronic civilizations of various kinds, um, just to expand that argument a bit. Um, if you think of the uh, the Earth's history, it's taken nearly four billion years for the marvelous biosphere of which we are a part to evolve from uh, the uh, primordial oceans in the young Earth, bar Darwinian selection. And uh, in the last uh, few millennia, and especially in the last century or two, we've had a, um, a civilization with advanced technology, um, but that is a tiny fraction of time, a few thousand years rather than four billion years. Um, and so um, uh, the sliver of time when there is a flesh and blood civilization on an evolving planet is very short. And uh, we don't know what's going to happen in the future, but it may well be that within another thousand years or, or so, um, we have been superseded by some kind of post-humans. Uh, they, they could be um, biologically engineered humans using genetic modification, uh, or they could be cyborgs. They could be electronic. I think the latter is more likely because there's a there's more scope for miniaturization and et cetera, uh, whereas perhaps uh, um, our brains have got as far as flesh and blood entities can get us. So anyway, um, we've probably got only a, a few millennia at most um, of, uh, of flesh and blood civilizations. But the other point, which um, astronomers realize, but uh, is not so widely realized by the public, is that the future is even longer than the past. I mean, most people are now aware of Darwinian evolution, that we're the outcome of four billion years of evolution, but many of them still somehow tend to think that we humans are the culmination, the top of the tree. But no astronomers can believe that, because um, we know that the sun is less than halfway through its life. It's got six billion more years to go. And the uh, galaxy and the universe have a far longer future, maybe even infinite. And I'd like to quote Woody Allen, who said, eternity is very long, especially towards the end. And so we're nowhere near the culmination, maybe not even a halfway stage in the emergence of complexity. Um, and, uh, and so um, this leads us to think the following, that suppose there's another Earth out there somewhere in our part of the galaxy, you might observe, then it's most unlikely that it'll be synchronized to within a few thousand years. So while we've got our flesh and blood civilization, it also has. It may be a laggard by a billion years, in which case it will uh, um, have no, no complex life on it at all yet, or it could be uh, a planet around a much older star, which has had a billion year head start, in which case um, the... Uh, um, the phase of evolution corresponding to us today could have been in the remote past and it could have uh, developed generation after generation of um, electronic entities. And so if we think of um, what we're most likely to see in our SETI searches, obviously the, uh, the laggard planets won't give any trace of any intelligence signal, whereas um, if there was a, a planet which had been through a stage like the Earth a long time ago, and had spawned all kinds of post-human entities, some flesh and blood maybe, but mainly uh, electronic, uh, then, of course, um, it's those entities which are more likely to be detected by a SETI program. And, uh, and the question is, um, so we should keep our eyes open for them. Um, and, uh, uh, of course, what would we expect them to do? I mean, the traditional view, as you know, is that... Uh, um, uh, if they if they go on evolving by doing in selection, um, they'll be more intelligent than us, perhaps, and also they'll be aggressive because Darwinian in selection favors aggression, and and that's why uh, people think that um, uh, they will they will come come to the earth and uh, eat us or something like that. Um, and in any case, um, uh, they, they would make themselves conspicuous because they'd be expansionist, etc. And this, of course, leads to the famous Fermi paradox which says that um, given that some of these um, uh, planets where life started could have been way ahead of the Earth, why haven't they come here? Why haven't we seen these uh, aliens with their 
eyes on stalks and all that uh, uh, coming to the earth. And, uh, and so it's often said that this is an argument that uh, advanced life is rare. Now, I think uh, there's a fallacy in that um, because if um, the advanced stages of post-human intelligence are electronic, um, they're not going to be evolving by Darwinian selection. It's going to be what I like to call secular intelligent design. It'll be the machines designing better machines, etc. Uh, and so, uh, uh, and so, if that's the case, then the um, uh, designs um, will perhaps want to uh, improve the intelligence or other qualities of of the these uh, entities, but they won't be aggressive necessarily. And so, it could be that the uh, um, most advanced um, brains in the galaxy are electronic entities which are just living contemplative lives, thinking deep thoughts and having uh, no wish to uh, make themselves too conspicuous. And um, this is exciting because whereas the Fermi paradox makes one suspect that there isn't much advanced life out there, uh, if you think of things this way, then there could be huge numbers of uh, entities out there with uh, vastly greater um, powers of thinking and reasoning and imagination than anything on the earth. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, there's no reason to think that we could uh, conceive what they're like because uh, um, they'd be more different from us than we are from slime mold. And, and, uh, uh, and so we've no idea what they'd be like, but uh, the universe could be um, pervaded by amazing entities like that. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, we've got to see if we can find them, uh, evidence for them, um, even though they may not be themselves expansionist. And uh, this is a very exciting quest. So go going back to SETI programs, um, it's very important to uh, look very hard uh, for any um, manifestly artificial transmission that could come from these entities. Um, and, of course, um, we should also uh, look for anything in our solar system, which looks <clears throat> um, um, uh, strange. I mean, uh, um, you, you mentioned in our conversation the sentinel in the famous uh, uh, oh. story, yes. um, and uh, there could be something like that, and, and the entity in 2001, etc. Um, or there could be um, what um, Jim Benford calls lurkers, objects in our solar system, just um, there, perhaps waiting until um, humans have got to a certain stage of development before they reveal their presence. And uh, and so we should um, look out for anything like that. Um, we should look for anything that's shiny in the asteroid belt and that looks artificial. But of course, this raises another question because um, uh, what should we do if we find it? Um, as you know, there's a debate but, um, uh, involving some people who think that we ought to hide from aliens, I call the, the, the METI project, people who think, who worry about us sending out a, uh, 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 a signal to reveal ourselves in the hope of, of starting two-way communications. Um, and, uh, and there are people who think we shouldn't do this because we should, we should hide because they might then come, come and attack us. Um, I've always found it hard to take that idea seriously because um, they probably know we're here already. They might have been um, uh, monitoring us for um, millions of years because of the likelihood that intelligence would emerge on this particular planet. Um, so um, that, that could happen. Um, but uh, I, I think in the case of one of these uh, sentinels or some alien objects, um, I do think there's something in it. And I think we should be rather cautious about... Uh, going up to it and poking it and even trying to take it apart. So I think that if we found an object that uh, seems artificial and therefore possibly something which was um, left um, uh, by some uh, advanced technology, then I think it's a real question what we should do. Um, I don't think we should uh, uh, attempt to take it apart. Uh, we, we should sort of protect it, uh, I, I think, because something may happen um, uh, if it realizes that, or it's, um, uh, or that those who send it realize that it's been uh, observed, um, but well, but you can be on the lookout for things like that. 
You know, I again, I appreciate your touch. You have touched on so many tremendous topics so far, and I, I want to come back to a few of those. But so when you talked about the time component of civilizations, that's what they call the, I guess, the L factor in the Drake equation, the length of time that a biological civilization is likely to last. And we don't have a firm idea what that is. I think Frank Drake just kind of made an estimate. But the idea is, I mean, we've seen species come and go, you know, and we know that they don't last forever, even here on Earth, right? Like the dinosaurs, they came and they went and there was a time factor to that. Given that our galaxy itself is about 13 billion years old, isn't it more likely that we'll encounter the ruins of past civilizations, perhaps their machine remnants, as well as planets full of life where intelligence never evolved than active civilizations. Yes, but I think um, the, the two things. I mean, uh, I think the number that Drake uh, guesses or guessed for um, uh, the duration of the civilization was quite small, a millennium or something like that. Um, and and that, of course, is um, is appropriate because, um, as I say, we can't predict what things will be like a thousand years from now. They're changing so much faster. So the um, uh, lifetime of a civilization is probably much shorter than the lifetime of an average species, which, as you say, is typically a million or a few years. Uh, so the lifetime of um, a technological civilization made of flesh and blood is probably less than that. And uh, if, if I take the present case, it's uh, um, maybe just a few thousand years. Um, but of course, um, its progeny, its legacy, as it were, um, all, all these machine entities, they're near immortal. And so, um, uh, they, they, they may have been being created over the last billion years if there was a planet a billion years ahead of the Earth. And, and so it's far, far more likely that you will detect some of them uh, than detect a flesh and blood um, civilization uh, in its sort of active phase uh, like ours. Of course, the counter argument is that if it's not conspicuous, that will be hard to detect, but certainly there will be far more uh, intelligence in the universe in that post-human form uh, than yeah. now. Um, and, um, uh, of course, the, the, the only um, rider to add to this is that um, uh, we maybe aren't typical. I mean, it, it could be that uh, we are unusually early, of course, some people think that uh, we're the only ones that made it this far, you know. So um, it could be that um, um, we are um, uh, much earlier in our uh, evolution towards intelligence than would be the average of uh, planets, even other planets will. So, so uh, that that's, uh, points the other way, that uh, um, m most planets, even those around older stars, may not have got as far as us because uh, we may have had a unusually fast progress and uh, escaped these so-called bottlenecks in evolution, which could be holding up or stymieing evolution in other cases. Well, I appreciate your touching on that because one of the things that I get really excited about are the deeper implications of the Drake equation. And I think that when most people look at it, right, they, they do the estimated calculations and they say, okay, we're likely to find X number of civilizations out there. Mm -hmm. And depending on how optimistic they are, depending on how they do the math, that could be mm -hmm. a large number, it could be a small number, right? Yeah. But they all seem to kind of jump through that right to the end. But when you look at what the implications are of that full equation, when he breaks things down, you know, I, I mean – it seems like for every planet that has an intelligent civilization on it, there may be thousands, potentially millions with life of some kind or other, and potentially thousands, maybe millions with ancient ruins of past life. And so yes. for me, that's just as inspiring as searching mm -hmm. for active civilizations. And I, I think, think yeah. it goes to what you're saying as well. Yes. And of course, the um, the, the future... Um, electronic entities that may replace us um, may not want to stay on the planet at all um, because they may prefer zero G, they may not need an atmosphere and um, if they're near immortal 
they may not be daunted by interstellar voyages. Um, so we don't know where they are, um, but uh, we should look for them. And I completely agree that the the betting would be that there are far more of those um, than there are um, entities at our sort of stage of evolution. But now going to what you said earlier, uh, it, the the Drake equation is very human centric, and again, that makes sense going back to what they were attempting to solve for. Dr. Kevin Newth at the University at Albany recently reworked the Drake equation and attempted to basically approach it from the perspective of extraterrestrial civilizations. And his estimates were that if we were found by ET explorers, it may have happened up to half a million years ago or potentially much longer. So I think you touched on that a moment ago. You were saying, look for shiny objects in the asteroid belt. And I'm wondering if we should be searching the solar system a little more carefully for ancient ET artifacts, in addition to the search that we're already doing for radio signals and potentially techno signatures in other star systems. Yes. Oh, I think we should, because uh, um, they, they, they could have um, uh, put these lurkers there up to a billion years uh, ago, because um, the oldest stars in our galaxy um, nearly twice as old as the sun. Um, and uh, uh, and so that therefore means that planets around those stars have a big head start. Um, they will have heavy elements and all that, but it's not quite as simple. But, but uh, um, certainly it's quite likely uh, that there was a civilization a billion years ago, and uh, it could have left a lot of debris in the final billion years. Yeah. But of course, um, uh, but, but one point I, I would make is that um, we we can't really conceive of, of, of this because um, I, I really believe that we're talking about uh, such a jump in uh, intelligence that is far bigger than the jump from uh, um, uh, a monkey to a human. I mean, we know that uh, um, a... Uh, a monkey can't understand quantum mechanics or anything like that, and then we, we can understand a lot more. Um, but uh, um, it could be that um, the completely um, uh, mysterious aspect of reality, which we just haven't a clue about, either because of lack of intelligence or because of lack of appropriate sense organs, we just don't know. And so I think we've got to be very open-minded indeed about what could exist out there that we are not even aware of. Well, that's an important point, and you have delved deeply into consciousness and a lot of uh, many more esoteric aspects of this science and technology that I, I'm not even touching on today. And perhaps we could come back to that, but I would have to do much more research to do justice mm -hmm. to that in terms of an interview. Um, what interested me about Kevin Newth's analysis was that he's touching on concepts that you described in the, the end of Astronauts but he mm -hmm. was approaching it from the perspective of humanity as the goal of an ET civilization study program, which for me, I thought was an interesting reversal. I thought, you know, we, we always tend to look at SETI as us looking out, trying to find someone else. What happens mm -hmm. if they are looking out, trying to find us? And mm -hmm. it did. It brought me back to Arthur C. Clarke's vision from the Sentinel, which you mentioned earlier where humans find robot probes on the moon, just quietly watching and waiting for yeah. millennia for our species yeah. to grow up. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I'd wondered, you know, could, could it be that extraterrestrial machine intelligence has been here quietly right under our nose the whole time, just watching and waiting? Indeed. Certainly quite possible. Hmm. You've got to be very open-minded. And uh, um, in terms of... Uh, uh, of astronomy programs, um, we should look at everything we can. You know, obviously, um, people have tended to look in the radio band uh, and uh, see if there's some sort of um, signal which looks artificial and which they can even perhaps try and interpret. Um, that's a good start, um, but uh, um, it's, I think, very unlikely that we will get a um, uh, communication of a kind which we can translate. I mean, obviously, lots of discussion about setting up a dialogue. And apart from the fact that um, it would take a signal um, decades to get um, from here to there and back again. So there's 
no scope for snappy repartee, as it were. Um, it could be that the um, uh, uh, it's most unlikely that there's enough similarity um, to um, uh, allow any kind of transmission by language. Although there are people, in fact, there's a professor here in Cambridge who's had a conference on how you would set up a, a language to communicate. And there was a, a book by someone called Hans Freudenthal in 1960s about uh, how you would set up a language. You set up by uh, sending uh, mathematical statements, which they'd have in common and physical statements, etc., and build up. And you could do this, but that assumes that um, there's something at the other end which is not too different from, from us. Whereas it might be so different that there'd be um, no... Um, meeting of minds even in the uh, most extreme sense well i think the takeaway from all of this definitely the takeaway from the end of astronauts and the breakthrough conference discussion and i'm going to put links to those in the show notes i want to recommend that people definitely check those out and learn more is that no matter what we find where we find it our search and exploration of space is exciting this is going to be something that is tremendous Absolutely. and it, it is changing the way that we look at the universe and the way that we look at the human race as well uh, martin mm -hmm. let me thank you so much for your time today again it is a tremendous honor to be able to interview you you have been such a giant figure in astronomy science technology and futurism i want to close by asking what are your plans for the first part of 2024 and do you anticipate seeing more headlines with announcements about SETI, exoplanets, or potentially extraterrestrial technosignatures in the months ahead? Yes. Um, well, I'm just uh, so excited that um, something is happening in my subject, from uh, uh, understanding the Big Bang to understanding exoplanets, and also in kindred subjects like uh, understanding the brain and all that. I think uh, we had a wonderful era and um uh, it's a wonderful time for young people to engage with scientific careers because uh, uh, the uh, frontier uh, is advancing so fast uh, but that, that means that more questions come into view the periphery gets longer and we've got all kinds of new th things to study with new instruments and with um more powerful computers to help us so there's so much going on um so i certainly expect that we will find out more about exoplanets uh, they exhibit huge variety. Um, some are covered in type of water. Some may have continents. And uh, we're going to find uh, more about them. Um, and I think we are going to um, find out more about other extreme objects in the uh, ga galaxy, um, black holes and um, uh, all kinds of other strange objects. Um, and, of course, we should be on the lookout for uh, something which could be artificial and in fact the um the breakthrough listen um campaign uh, which, which you mentioned um uh, is really trying to um ensure that astronomers in doing their normal programs can at the same time um uh, have instruments that could detect something very unusual um not not stopping doing what they want to do anyway but uh, uh having some way of uh, analyzing a spectrum in a way that um would um reveal something artificial and we don't know what, what it would be um because to take a, a, a old-fashioned example um a um uh, uh, a, mo a modern radio, uh, radio engineer um may uh, not understand amplitude modulation which was the old the old system before we had fm and so uh, that's a change in our lifetime and there may be all kinds of other changes um which would imply that even if they were using the radio band, um, it may not be something we could decode easily. And of course, um, the radio band is just the one that we've used because um, big radio telescopes are very sensitive. Um, but uh, we should look in all wave bands for things that might be mysterious uh, and might be um, uh, uh, technological artifacts rather than natural. Wonderful. Let me thank you again so much for your time today, sir. Well, thank you very much for hosting me.